everyone and welcome back to the Northeast Georgia History Center's live streams. I am Marie Walker, the director of the Ada May Ivester Education Center here and today I'm going to be talking to you about the life and death of Princess Charlotte. Now you've probably heard of the Victorian era which was named after, well, Queen Victoria because in the history of the United Kingdom the Victorian era was the period of Queen Victoria's reign, which began on the 20th of June, 1837, and ended upon her death on the 22nd of January, 1901. The Victorian era followed the Georgian period and preceded the Edwardian period. But what if I told you it almost didn't happen? Victoria who became one of the longest reigning monarchs and most famous monarchs in history, was never supposed to be queen. It was Princess Charlotte who was supposed to sit on the throne instead. Born at the Carlton House on the 7th of January, 1796, Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales was the only child of the very ill-fated marriage between George Prince of Wales, then later King George IV, and Caroline of Brunswick. As the sole legitimate grandchild of George III, she became the presumptive heir to the British throne at birth. And interestingly enough, George III wrote shortly after her arrival that he had, and I quote, always wished it to be of that sex. This does not, however, signify the king's desire for a future queen, as he disclosed his hopes that the princess's birth would serve, and I quote again, as a bond of additional union and reconciliation between her parents. Presumably leading to the birth of a male heir. This wish would never be realized, though, as the Prince and Princess of Wales unofficially separated shortly after the birth of Charlotte. Charlotte's parents, George and Caroline, had been in an arranged marriage, very, very common for royalty of this time. But George had only agreed to get married to Caroline of Brunswick to get Parliament to settle his enormous debts. George had kind of already secretly married Maria Fitzherbert, but this marriage to Fitzherbert violated the Royal Marriages Act of 1772, which said that you have to get the sovereign's permission to marry. Therefore, he did not have the sovereign's permission to marry Maria Fitzherbert, and therefore, his marriage was not legally valid even though they were living as man and wife. So because they did not have the monarch's permission to marry, therefore the marriage was not recognized. Basically, she was treated as the king, well, the future king's mistress. And therefore he was told to marry Caroline of Brunswick. Now on first sight, of his new future wife, Caroline of Brunswick, George was thoroughly dismayed and in a state of shock. I am not well, he announced. Pray, get me a glass of brandy. Certainly, this is not the reaction that Caroline was hoping for from her future husband. The marriage ceremony proceeded as arranged though, uh, and it was attended by his well-pleased father, George III. And on the evening of the 8th of April, 1795, at the Royal Chapel at St. James Palace, the bride wore an elaborate dress of silver tissue and lace and a velvet robe lined with ermine. The distraught bridegroom spent his wedding night lying in the bedroom floor by the fireplace in a drunken stupor. It was also indicated that he was most likely drunk for his wedding as well. Now, although um, George was, in his words, repelled by his wife, he did his duty and brought himself to consummate the marriage, and the Princess of Wales gave birth to a daughter and heir to the throne, Princess Charlotte, exactly nine months after their marriage on the 7th of January, 1796, at Carlton House. 
After the birth of the child, George promptly abandoned Caroline. Just three days after Charlotte's birth, George made out a new will. He left all of his property to Maria Fitzherbert, my wife, while to Caroline he left one shilling. The press vilified George, which was rather deserving in my opinion, for his extravagance and luxury at a time of war, and they portrayed Caroline as a wronged wife, which, well, she kind of was. Now, George was dismayed at Caroline's popularity and his own unpopularity, and he felt rather trapped in a loveless marriage with a woman that he loathed. But he didn't really um, do necessarily anything to get the press on his side either. The prince was resolved that his wife should not be involved in decisions regarding the care of their daughter and took guardianship of Princess Charlotte in conjunction with the monarch. The care of Princess Charlotte was prudently considered, but the Prince of Wales relied heavily upon the advice of his mother, Queen Charlotte, for who Princess Charlotte is named. Princess Charlotte initially lived at Carlton House with her father and mother, who did primarily reside there until 1798. But then her mother moved to her own modest household, Shrewsbury House, in 1799. Princess Charlotte's education took the form of a strictly regimented routine, which, as befitting a future queen, was rigorous in comparison to most girls of her time. Her lessons included history, French, English, Latin, and religious instruction, accompanied by dancing and music, with time that also allowed for other amusements and horseback riding. She was taught by composer Jane Mary Guest, and Charlotte became quite the accomplished pianist. Her education was not solely provided by governesses, as, well, a lot of wealthy females at this time, a lot of wealthy girls, they would have been primarily taught by governesses. But she also had teachers, which included John Fisher, the Bishop of Exeter. The princess was not a natural scholar, though. It is reported that she had poor spelling and handwriting, but she was nonetheless a bright girl who admired poetry and showed an interest in law and politics. Very important subjects for a future queen. It is also reported that she chose to learn only what she wanted to learn. <laughs> she demonstrated an interest for law and politics in 1811 when she asked for a copy of her father's parliamentary speech regarding the resolutions and regulations of a regency as, and I quote, it is a subject very interesting, all particularly so to me. One of the biggest political and family events that shaped the life of young Charlotte was the Regency when her grandfather, George III, was deemed unfit to rule due to his illness, and her father then served as Prince Regent. A Prince Regent is a prince who, due to their position in the line of succession, rules as a monarchy regent, or rules the monarchy as a regent. And a regent is a person appointed to administer a country because the monarch is a minor, absent, or incapacitated. At this point, this regency is due to the mental um, illness that George III was experiencing and therefore falls into the incapacitated category. And this time period, this time period when the Prince Regent is ruling is referred to as the Regency period in the United Kingdom. It was a period at the end of the Georgian era. So it is um, not necessarily its own time period. It's still part of the Georgian era, but it is a subsection of the Georgian era. Now upon George III's death in 1820, the Prince Regent becomes King George IV. And then Charlotte, would have become next in line to the throne. 
Princess Charlotte was known for her informal manner and hot temper, which at times made her relationship with those in her household difficult. The impression one gets from all the early recorded stories of Charlotte is of a happy recklessness and a warm heart. The princess's strong emotions are not only seen with her household relationships, uh, meaning those with her servants and courtiers, but in her intense friendships as well. She shared a lifelong bond with Priscilla Wellesley Pole, and she also had a close confidant in Margaret Mercer Elphinstone, to whom she entrusted with her most private affairs. She regularly saw her extended family, George III, Queen Charlotte, and her unmarried aunts, and the letters which passed between Princess Charlotte and her father provide a particularly fascinating glimpse into their complex relationship. Princess Charlotte evidently wished to please her father and often wrote to seek his approval and his forgiveness. The prince's letter to his daughter demonstrate the infrequency with which he visited her. Yet this is not necessarily a sign of indifference as he doted upon the young princess and his apologies were frequently accompanied by tokens of affection. After the separation of her parents, Princess Charlotte enjoyed regular visits with her mother, but eventually due to allegations of the Princess of Wales engaging in indiscreet and scandalous behavior, contact became increasingly restricted. By 1806, rumors that Caroline had taken lovers and had an illegitimate child led to an investigation into her private life. This was called the Delicate Inquiry. The dignitaries who led this investigation concluded that there was no foundation to the rumors, but Caroline's access to her daughter was nonetheless restricted. Charlotte favored the point of view that her mother was innocent, as did most of the public. Most people saw this as an attempt of George to catch his wife in the act of adultery so that he could divorce her by law and in the church. Now, the romantic life of Princess Charlotte was eventful. With the Prince Regent busy with affairs of state, Charlotte was required to spend most of her time at Windsor with her maiden aunts. Bored, she soon became infatuated with her first cousin, George Fitzclarence, who was the illegitimate son of the Duke of Clarence. Fitzclarence was, shortly thereafter, called to Brighton to join his regiment, and Charlotte's gaze fell on Lieutenant Charles Hess of the Light Dragoons who reputedly was the illegitimate son of Charlotte's uncle, Prince Frederick, Duke of York and Albany. Hess and Charlotte had a number of secret meetings from 1811 to 1813. Lady de Clifford feared that the Prince Regent would get very angry should he find out about these meetings. But Princess Caroline, Charlotte's mother, was delighted by her daughter's romance. She did everything that she could to help and encourage this relationship, even allowing them time alone in a room in her apartments. These meetings ended with, well, Hess leaving to join the British forces in Spain. In addition to Captain Hess, the princess was also linked to several others, such as Prince William Frederick of Gloucester. However, as future queen, she was expected to marry a high-ranking official, high-ranking foreign royalty, even better. And in 1813, her father, who was still then the Prince Regent, deemed William Hereditary Prince of Orange a suitable match. Such a marriage would increase British influence in Northwest Europe, which is good for the British Empire. It was a politically advantageous match. A meeting between the couple was arranged for December of 1814. But far from being enamored by the Hereditary Prince of Orange, Princess Charlotte was rather pressured into accepting an engagement 
with him. She was unable to alter her father's mind on the matter of the engagement. And he said that he would then just um, send her to the remote Cranbourne Lodge in Windsor for the remainder of her engagement if she had strong negative feelings, um, basically putting her in timeout. Um, but Charlotte was going to have none of that. Charlotte fled to her mother's house in protest of this arrangement. Her stunt resulted in public sympathy for Charlotte, and she decided to break off the engagement in a letter to the hereditary Harry Prince of Orange in June of 1814. The Prince Regent was dismayed by the termination of the agreed engagement, but he eventually accepted his daughter's strong and fixed aversion to a match with a man for whom she could never regard, uh, which is, well, necessary in a matrimonial connection. At the close of 1815, with the engagement to the hereditary Prince of Orange at an end, Princess Charlotte presented another candidate for her hand to her father, declaring her favor of the Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, whom she had met in 1814. Now, in the January of 1816, so a few years after they had met, the Prince Regent invited his daughter to the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, and there she pleaded with him to allow the marriage to Leopold. On her return to Windsor, she wrote her father, I no longer hesitate in declaring my partiality in favor of the Prince of Kohlberg, assuring you that no one will be more steady or consistent in their present and last engagement than myself. George Gavin and Simon Leopold, who was in Berlin on his uh, way to Russia, and then, but instead of going to Russia, he came back to Britain. And Leopold then arrived in Britain in late February of 1816 and went to Brighton to be interviewed by the Prince Regent. After Charlotte was invited as well, and they all had dinner. After which she wrote to her father saying, I find him charming and go to bed happier than I have ever done yet in my life. I am certainly a very fortunate creature and have to bless God. A princess never, I believe, set out in life or married with such prospects of happiness, real domestic ones, like other people. So obviously in this letter, we can see that Princess Charlotte is very much in love with Prince Leopold and feels like this is not just a political alliance, but an actual, real marriage like other people have. So the Prince Regent, after meeting with Prince Leopold, granted his daughter's wish, and the Prince and Princess wed at Carlton House on the 2nd of May, 1816. On the wedding day, huge crowds filled London. At nine o'clock in the evening, in the crimson drawing room at Carlton House, with Leopold dressed for the first time as a British general, the couple were married. Charlotte wore a beautiful silver wedding gown and the dress cost over 10,000 pounds. Now, the only mishap during the ceremony was when Charlotte was heard to giggle when the impoverished Leopold promised to endow her with all his worldly goods. The couple honeymooned at Otland's Palace, which is the home of her uncle, the Duke of York's residency in Surrey. Princess Charlotte and her husband returned to London for the social season, and when they attended the theater for the first time, they were treated to wild applause from the crowd, and they also sang God Save the King from the company. But when she was taken ill at the opera, there was great public concern about her condition, and it was seemed to be announced that she had suffered a miscarriage. 
Now, the couple was very, very popular with the public. And for a time, they resided at Camelford House, but then they moved the following August to Claremont House in Surrey. At the end of April of 1817, Leopold informed the Prince Regent that Charlotte was again pregnant and that there was every prospect of the princess carrying this baby to term. Charlotte's pregnancy was the subject of the most intense public interest. Betting shops quickly set up books on what sex the child would be, economics, calculated that the birth of a princess would raise the stock market by 2.5% and that the birth of a prince would raise it 6%. Now, Charlotte spent most of her time during her pregnancy quietly, and she spent a lot of this time sitting for a portrait by Sir Thomas Lawrence. Now, when the princess labors began, on the 3rd of November, 1817, she was significantly overdue and had a long and difficult delivery, which resulted in the birth of a stillborn son two days later. After the birth, Princess Charlotte initially appeared to recover, but soon after midnight, Charlotte began vomiting violently and complaining of pains in her abdomen. Sir Richard was then called and was alarmed to find his patient cold to the touch and had difficulty breathing and also bleeding. He placed hot compresses on her, the accepted treatment at the time for postpartum bleeding, but the blood did not stop. Due to complications, she died five hours later in the early hours of the 6th of November. Henry Broham wrote of the public reaction to Charlotte's death. It really was as though every household throughout Great Britain had lost a favorite child. The whole kingdom went into deep mourning. Linen drapers ran out of black cloth. Even the poor and those experiencing homelessness try to express their sympathy and their mourning by tying armbands of black cloth around their clothes. The shops closed for two weeks, as did the Royal Exchange, the courts of law, and the docks. Even gambling dens shut down on the day of her funeral as a mark of respect. The Prince Regent was prostate with grief and was unable to attend his own child's funeral. Princess Caroline heard the news from a passing courier as she had moved to Italy several years before and she fainted from the shock. No one had seemed uh, that it was urgent to inform her. The Prince Regent was not going to have any communication with his estranged wife. He believed that Prince Leopold was going to inform Princess Caroline, but he did not. On recovering, Princess Caroline stated, England, that great country, has lost everything in losing my ever beloved daughter. Even the Prince of Orange, who she had broken off the engagement with, burst into tears at hearing the news of her death and his wife he had found someone to to marry ordered the ladies of her court into mourning the greatest effect of course fell on prince leopold stockmar wrote years later that november saw the ruin of his happy home and the destruction at one blow of every hope and happiness of prince leopold he has never recovered the feelings of happiness which had blessed his short married life. The princess was buried with her son at her feet in St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle on the 19th of November, 1817. A monument by the sculptor Matt Coates White was erected by public subscription at her tomb, further showing just how much the public adored Princess Charlotte. 
Now, it was not long before the public began to pin blame for the tragedy on, well, someone. The Queen and the Prince Regent were blamed for not being present at the birth, although Charlotte had specifically requested that they stay away. And although the postmortem was inconclusive, many blamed Croft for his care of the princess, even though the Prince Regent refused to blame Dr. Croft. Sir Richard Croft was just one of the attending doctors at the delivery of Princess Charlotte but his decision to forego the use of forceps to assist the birth, which at the time the use of forceps was a potentially lethal instrument because it was only used in the direst of situations since, well, they couldn't really be sterilized. But this is really what the public focused on, is Dr. Croft foregoing the use of forceps. Croft also blamed himself for the princess's death, despite the Prince Regent's assurance of faith in his decision. Even nonetheless, though, Dr. Croft took his own life a few months later, resulting in what was called the Triple Obsteric Tragedy. Princess Charlotte's death caused a succession crisis that brought pressure to the Duke of Kent and his unmarried brothers to marry and have children because there was now no heir. In 1818, Prince Edward, Duke of Kent and Strathairn, the fourth son and fifth child of King George III, married Princess Victoria of saxe coburg Stalfeld, a widowed German princess with two children by her first marriage. Her brother Leopold, was Princess Charlotte's widower. The Duke and Duchess of Kent would go on to have one child together, Victoria, who was born at 4.15 a.m. on the 24th of May, 1918, almost two years after the death of Princess Charlotte at Kensington Palace in London. After the deaths of Princess Victoria's father, Prince Edward, and her grandfather, George III, in 1820, she was raised under close supervision by her mother and her comptroller, John Conroy. Queen Victoria then inherited the throne at age 18 after her father's three elder brothers died without a surviving legitimate child. She was, by default, Queen of Great Britain. And therefore, that's how we got the Victorian age, how she became one of the longest reigning and she also was one of the most popular monarchs in recent British history. One of the reasons why she was so popular is that she brought what we might consider morality back to the British aristocracy because as you might have gathered through <laughs> this presentation, King George III was very much loved at first um, through his reign. People did have um, an affection for King George III, but then with his illness, um, he was no longer able to rule. Then came in George IV, the Prince Regent, who people did not like for many of the reasons stated in this presentation. And that is who, when George IV died, Queen Victoria then ascended to the throne. Since he was incredibly unpopular, a nice young queen, very much the opposite of her, well, uh, uncle who liked to indulge in many things, became perhaps a symbol of hope and a revitalization of, of Britain and their, well, empire at this point. At this point in history, Great Britain is a colonial empire. You might have heard the sun never sets on the British Empire because they had so many colonial holdings all around the world. And that is what Queen Victoria is stepping into as she becomes queen and the dawn of the Victorian age starts. 
So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you learned something. A lot of people do not know about Princess Charlotte and her very interesting life and how it really shaped the Victorian age. Uh, Princess Charlotte's life and death did. Otherwise, if Charlotte had lived and had her child live, Queen Victoria might not have even been born because the Duke of Kent really only seemed to get married because there was a lot of pressure on him and his brothers to go out and get married and have children so that the line of succession could continue through their bloodline. So I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for being members of the Northeast Georgia History Center. We very much appreciate it. And until next time, 